Gallagher, the great man. You ready to rock and roll? Ready to go. We're Get going. my memory out. We're going back to the year of 1998. Now, do you recall that year? It was a weird old year. There was 20 teams in the comp. Yeah, it was a strange year. Um, Super League and ARL had got back together, uh, created a new comp. Melbourne's first year in the competition, um, and Canterbury under a new coach and mm. Stephen Folkes. So, 20-team um, comp, and, and more surprisingly, 10-team semi. Yes. 10-team <laughs> semi. Can you believe that? It was an amazing stuff. And look, we are going to get to the moment, that moment we all recall Parramatta take on the Bulldogs. The rivalry between the Bulldogs and the Eels is fierce. We all know that. Can I say I'm only just allowed back in Parramatta Mall at Peter Wynn's at the moment. <laughs> just now. Just this year. Just this year. I've been barred from Parramatta for <laughs> well, that long. Well, you might be barred again after this, by the <laughs> way, once they get remembered about this, uh, this magic moment. But anyway, let's go back. Let's go right back to where... That year started. Uh, well, it started pretty slow for you guys. You get to round 21. You're under the Donald Trump. You are not playing finals. You can look ahead to Hawaii or wherever you want to go to get booked. Uh, round 21, you meet the Magpies, and that really turned things. We were a uh, really, really young team in 98. Um, the changes in the, um, the split uh, in the competition meant we brought a lot of young kids through, really good kids, and sort of uh, a group of us in the old group, Jason Hetherington, Darren Britt was captain, but we were extremely fit. Stephen Folk's a coach, um, Gary Carden, Billy Johnson still at the club, and five weeks, six weeks out from finals, they flog you at Canterbury. So you, when you get to finals, you're ready to go. Right. And we were getting hammered. And I think the, the week before the West game, they just tapered off a little bit. And, um, mate, we, we, we walked past uh, West like uh, they were left standing. Ten goals was, for you yeah, that day. Ten goals, a couple of tries too, um, uh, 28 points, I think. Um, but then that's been passed by the great man, uh, Il Masri. So, um, yeah, uh, that, that was a fond memory. But the year for us was about some confidence, and we needed to build some from there. Last game of the year, you have to win this to make the finals. Ten-team comp, you beat Illawarra with a field goal, so you're just walking along that tightrope. <laughs> then you play the Mighty Dragons, who were rorted. <laughs> I played in that game, third ever game for me, and your team rorted a seventh tackle try. I can't believe it. Remember Steve Clark? He had to get escorted from the ground, the referee. Well, 1995, we actually scored a seventh tackle try in the grand final to go down with Manly, <laughs> so it's not the first time for Canterbury. But, um, yeah, we had actually played at Cogra about a month before on a really windy day. Mm. Um, part of a, a winning streak of four games for us to give us some momentum. Um, so we didn't really fear coming back to Cogra and getting a win there. Mm. So, um, in fact, I think after that game, it was Mark Waugh um, come in the sheds and really? had a bit of a chat, yeah, and continued the sort of like a, the boost and the belief that we could actually kick on. And it's always great to see, you know, ex-Australian and the war boys and that Canterbury people around um, give us a, a good bit of confidence. So you sneak away with that, but because it's a 10-team comp, you've got to go five games, and you've already been up for a long time, as you mentioned. So you get to the second week against a team you're very familiar with, the Bears. Yeah, uh, the North Sydney Bears. Yes. Love-hate relationship with the Bears. <laughs> I'd love them to, to death. Some of them don't quite like me as much. Um, based on 1991, you know, I mean, D. Halligan could have put them in their first grand final since 1922. Yeah. Um, none, was it none from five? No, I kicked out two from five that day. Yep. But I am having a mare. You yeah. know, I, golden rules. So it was my first year in, in rugby league. I, I didn't want to miss left. I've been going across the face of goal, missing left. The very last kick uh, is only 30 metres out in front. And I, I said to myself, I'm not missing this left. Well, I've put it out right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg Alex. Alexander um, kicks uh, his goals and basically we're, we're out of action. So it was a fairly, after a great start to rugby league, 1991 for, for D Halligan, it was a fairly uh, unhappy Christmas, so to speak. Well, a Christmas full of kicking goals, actually. I yeah. went home and worked hard. Well, I actually, um, I was actually at that game. I was living in a little town called Lake Car Jelly Garden. We piled up the bus and we were, we thought it was the best day in the world. Sydney Football Stadium, we're right up the top. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, you missing these goals and and to think you know I'm standing here or sitting here with you today is unbelievable but that was a bit of a if one of my favorite sayings is sometimes the best gifts come badly wrapped now I remember reading the big league magazine that year on the front page it would have been around that year it's yourself it's Matty Ridge it's Jason Taylor and it's like sharp shooters in the big league and the rugby league and you were kicking it like 68 70 percent yep but that mare that was as you pretty good back then back then different <laughs> balls and and no tees yeah, sawdust yeah. or sand yeah Back in those days, it was pretty good, but one of my favourite sayings, sometimes the best gifts come badly wrapped. You having such a bad day that day, 
dramatically changed your standards and, and where it ultimately took you kicking wise? It did. I um, the, the next year I came back obviously wanting to get some redemption in terms of, you know, goal kicking is an individual skill that you can impose on a team. Um, and I certainly wanted to go back to Norse and improve uh, on the start of the year before and somehow wipe that, uh, mm. that grand final qualifier off the slate. Um, which started with, I, I kicked on Boxing Day. Yeah. A little place called Wittianga. Um, I'd taken some uh, footballs home. Um, and I booted them all back myself too. Sometimes, you know, family members and that yeah, might come yeah. and give you a hand. I said, nah, I've got to sort the demons out. So old railway posts or the wooden ones, telegraph poles um, down there and uh, knocked 20 or 30 goals, maybe 40 goals. And that was a start. And um, then I got back into pre-season after that and stuck to the same routine. Um, so what was your routine? Routine is, um, I used to start with six in front from about 25 out, so with all due respect, you should kick uh, six from six. Then I'd move 15 to the side of the post, right-hand side first, um, kick another six from there. I wouldn't kick from touch line. I'd go to five metres in from touch, kick six from there. Um, you know, if you're at 80%, you hopefully get five or four from each of those spots, and then I'd repeat it on the left-hand side of the field. So I'd repeat six from 15 in so on the left. So 30 kicks. Yeah, and then six in front to finish. Right, 36 kicks. Two kicks um, in the last six, I'd put pressure on myself to actually nail. So I didn't go and try and have it as a match kick for every kick of 30 kicks. But um, then You'd say uh, you have to kick this goal. Yeah, I'd say this one's game simulation. Yep. And then I might have another one because uh, I might be working on strike or balance or something like that. And then I'd go, now this one's another game simulation. So I generally only have two kicks a session that I'd go, this is game-like. If you missed it? You don't get to do it again, that's just, you've missed that kick. No, I, um, I, I learned early on that if I was doing my 30 kicks, and I did that three times a week, um, which I got pretty sort of strict on, that that was my um, final, and that was fate. So, but if you if you do the numbers, you know, um, 36, three times a week, sort of. 100-ish. 100-ish, 120 by the time you have a couple before the game and that sort of stuff, 40 weeks of the year, there's 4,000 kicks. I mean, if you're not kicking well by then, you're... Elephant, really, aren't you? Yeah, I, I, I actually, you, you remind me, I, I would do the same thing. So game day, I'd go down uh, to a local school or something and have a few mm. kicks. And I remember, I actually remember being in, I was very lucky to fluke the top point scorer in 2000. I think everyone was uh, too busy uh, on the drinky poos worrying about the Olympics. I wasn't time. keeping an eye on you. <laughs> I normally get the voodoo doll out and go, Joel oh, Kane, <laughs> miss that one. <laughs> but you'd, you'd won four top point scorers and, and you're on your way to your fifth one. And I, and I remember this day because there's three rounds to go and... I'm playing against the great man at ANZ Stadium and I've got about a 10 point lead on you. So I've got to put you to bed somehow. I'm absolutely petrified of you. <laughs> and in the first half, I've jagged a try and I've kicked three goals and now I've got a gap of about 20. So I'm probably going to win this thing. You know, this little <laughs> battler who's fluked this thing, you know, yours weren't fluked. Valium Award night, yeah, here I'm goes gonna Joel walking up. But then the second half, <laughs> I'm scoreless. You've got to try bang four from four. So I've actually had a net loss for the game. Were you, I was absolutely uh, watching other players and whether they kicked it or missed it. Or Did you worry about that sort of stuff in the point scoring records and those sorts of things? Sure. Um, initially, no. I, I didn't even really cross my mind in the early years, even though you're happy to um, you know, receive the accolades and, and what have you. But as time went on, yeah, I did. I, um, I took no pleasure in seeing you know, someone like uh, Matthew Ridge kick a goal from the sideline or what have you. Um, in fact, I really wanted to sort of make sure that that was me. Yeah. that people saw, you know, not that you could publicly come out and say that, you know, it was just part of who you are, what you wanted to deliver back to your team. Um, and, and in essence, while it's a little bit selfish, it, it's actually why you practice yep. uh, to get good at it. So if he played on a Friday night Ridge, for example, or Johns or Girdler or whoever it was at the time, yep. you, you, you knew you were four in front or behind him and you'd be counting on the run and during the game you'd know that there's sometimes not a lot that you could actually do about yep. how many points you're going to score in a game, for sure. You yep. can't. Your teammates control that. Yes. And, and you have the benefit of you know, converting some points after scoring a couple of tries if you're lucky. Um, so you, you don't really get a control of saying, I'm going to score 20 points tomorrow so I can be top point yes. scorer in the comp. But you sort of like each week and grab the telly mirror and have a look who's in the point scoring, you know what I mean? And then I think, oh, good, OK, I'm 15 ahead of uh, yep. Ridgie or, you know, here on Cross and, oh, he got 20 last week, you know what I mean? Or <laughs> whoever it was. So you always sort of know where your opposition are and, and I mean all those little things are part and parcel about driving yourself you know yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to where you want to want to be 
You know, um, you mentioned the name Eon Cross, and I just thought of Chuck, uh, Chuck Heron. Remember <laughs> yeah, Chuck Heron? Yeah. Great fella. I'll see him around. A little step time. and a real sharp. Oh, you used to do these ones. Look, you'd be kicking on like this, Chuck Heron. Yeah, yeah. Did, you, what, did you ever get to the bottom of why he did that? Goal kickers are weird, aren't we? Yeah, we're you know weird. I mean? we're all, Howard, he's got his run up. And we're all different, you know what I mean? I, I've sort of, and, and working coaching for the last 15 odd years, 20 years, um, I've come to believe that everyone's allowed to have their own little idiosyncrasies. Yeah. In essence, they mean a lot to them, but they don't mean a lot to the actual technique. Yes. So, you know, I mean, they come at various angles of the, of the football, but if it's them and it's how that relaxes them and puts them in a positive mind frame, then it's pretty powerful. I picked you up this morning from the airport. Um, you'd just been coaching this morning in Canberra. Yep, so you're in coaching Canberra. coaching them. You're coaching Penrith. Yeah, uh, Bulldogs and the Warriors this year, so I've got a, got a fairly full book, so you can blame me. Yeah. And now, <laughs> and, and, and now I asked you... Um, who do you really like as a kicker? And you had a fair bit of respect for a kid that you're not necessarily coaching right now. Uh, got a couple of really good kids. Um, you know, Nathan Cleary goes about his business particularly well. Jared Croak is a real professional in Canberra. Um, at Canterbury, Nick Meaney's come on for the last couple of years yeah. and the Warriors' young Chanel Harris um, is going along great as well. Um, be interesting to see how Cole Flanagan um, goes about his business. I know he's a fairly driven kid. I haven't, had, I haven't had a lot to do with him. I, of course, I know his dad and what have you. Um, and so uh, a big step up this year into the big team mm. um, and, and how he uh, controls himself and delivers the goal kicking um, will, be, will be interesting. So, I mean, I always keep an eye on all the kickers in the comp. Yes. You know what I mean? Yep. Let's get back to 98. So yep. you've put St George controversially away. <laughs> uh, the Bears, your old club, they're gone. So now you've got uh, two games between you and a grand final. We start with the Knights. Yep. Knights are chock-a-block full of talent. A um, couple of guys called Johns who, <laughs> who can play the game a little bit. Ben Kennedy. Yeah. Um, coming off a couple of really successful seasons to the Johns boys. Um, the game's at the Sydney Football Stadium. They scoot out to 16-0 lead. We're in all sorts. Which, um, is, which is the equivalent of currency of being about 34-0 if those blokes are playing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and the difficult thing, I, I don't know what the catalyst in the turnaround in that game was, but we had defended really, really well early in the, the final series and only had a couple of tries or one try each scored against us. Um, we find some points in the second half and we run away winners 28-0. So... It was Steve Folks' first year of coaching, like we say. Um, Folks, he wasn't really all that big on long speeches yep. after the game. And so we get into the sheds after the game and um, everyone calms down a bit because we've got a grand final qualifier next yeah, week, you yeah. know what I mean? We're palmed, yeah. you know what I mean? And there's a lot of guys here that sat on the bench in 95 and they're going to be up against guys like Jared McCracken, Jimmy Dimmock, Dean Pay, who were at Canterbury the in 95. Firm. The old firm. And anyway, so uh, Folks, he stands there. And Jason he, Smith. Jason Smith, another one. So he, um, yeah, folks, he stands up and he goes, now listen, guys, he said, I can promise you, in my thoughts on Canterbury, that is the best comeback ever in the history of the club. You wow. know what I mean? Yeah. And then we just, yeah, we give it a, you know, yeah, folks, you know what I mean? Down 16 nil against the Knights. 16 nil down against yeah. the Johns boys, the Kennedys, yeah. you know, Darren Albert, all those good, Danny Baderas, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the momentum we were building yeah, was yeah. like, this is so much fun, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, let's go, you know what I mean? So we had a, um, a really good lead-in to the Parramatta game, which, um, you know, in essence, we finished ninth, remember? Yes. We're ninth. You know, Parramatta, I think, finished top four. Yeah. Melbourne actually finished third. Brisbane were the team of, of 98. But, yeah, we, we're starting to ride this wave and, and ride, it, ride it pretty well. So now you meet the old firm... Parramatta, and that number 16 you talk about, that's the deficit again, but you're running out of time. There's 11 minutes left. You pinch a try in the corner, 18 points to six. Now, the significance of this kick from the sideline is fairly significant because if you miss it, you, you know the equation that you've got to score some tries to, to get cut back into it, and it's going to be at some stage on your shoulders. 18 points to six, you've got a kick from the sideline. What happens to that first kick? Goes left. Never go left. Yeah. Right foot kicker should never kick across the face of goal. Is that and right? I, I'd, I'd sort of mentioned that to myself so many times. I even coach it, uh, even coach it to myself. Um, I played golf the other day, and, and a mate of mine Don't said, he said left. "100% of putters, 100% of uh, putts under the cup miss." So that's ah, what you're saying, aren't yeah, you? That, you that if yeah. you're going up left as a as a right-footed kicker on that left side, you've gone under the cup, so to speak. 
you generally rotate a little bit early, mm. under pressure, anxiety, things yep. happen a bit quicker, so you're sort of out of your kick before it's happened. So um, that, to me, relates to some shape pulling left, no matter where you are on the field. Um, so, I, and I, you know, I basically fell to my own error. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that, don't do that, did that. Yeah. Um, so that put a bit of pressure on, um, you know, and come six minutes to go in the game, okay, we're still trailing by 12. Um, beautiful ball from Robert Ralph. Yeah. I don't know Ralph. He, it was probably his best pass ever. He, he didn't even know Rod Silver was on the inside. He flicked <laughs> a little one of those, you know, Kurt Gidley one, out yeah. the back, and, uh, and Rocket rolls onto the ball. Oh, run, 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 oh yeah. You know he's still, playing, he's still playing touch footy. Oh, he would do, yeah. yeah. He was just so gifted. Had a massive step too, Rocket. Anyway, he just glided into the corner and then runs around and puts it down. And so now the pressure's on this, D. Halligan. This is a huge kick. Yeah, this is the kick to actually keep us in the game. Because six points, yeah, we can score, try and kick a goal, but um, eight points uh, people don't probably talk about not going to happen. Kick, but they don't yeah. talk about this one. This is the big one. But the learnings were there. Yep. Um, so take a couple of breaths, chill out. Knew to blow out at the top of my run-up and, um, yeah, um, put the memory on and uh, up inside right post. And it's pretty much middle, so uh, flags go up. And, hey, we're now in the game, you know what I mean? It's, it's on. Game on. So you're inside the final few minutes now. Then what happens? You do realise that half, or not half, but a good portion of the Canterbury crowd had actually left the stadium. Wow. But, you know, five or six minutes out. They just didn't believe we could actually come back because in the years gone by, I've had so many Canterbury supporters come and say, oh, I'm on the bus on the way home and I'm listening on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'm stopping the bus here and I'm getting the doors open and I'm running back to the stadium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all end up, we got extra time, so they got to see a little bit more footy. But I've had so many people tell me that story too. So, yeah. So now you fast forward to this moment that we're talking about. I, I just think it's so huge. Uh, the club's on the back of it. You're on this winning sequence. Try in the corner by Willie Talao. You know what? Willie could have passed me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I could have scored that. <laughs> if you watch the frame, I'm standing outside and sort of jumping and what have you. Could you have, but, if, if you had scored that, could you have got a bit closer? No, to no, no, no. There no. was always cover coming across. Right. I would have been catching and pass and I didn't have a speed run round anyway. I would have just <laughs> dived down in the corner. Um, so, yeah, so w Willie scores the try and then I'm thinking, OK, whew, show a little bit of emotion. Um, Give him a pat on the back. I know I've got to go and get the ball yeah. and deliver a kick. So I actually thought uh, late in my career, I thought, you know, it's always a good thing to go and show some motion after we've scored points in that because it relaxes you. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So luckily got to do that and then head back with the ball. Um, no one actually said anything to me at all. You know what I mean? Sometimes in that situation, I hear people come and uh, the captain will come up and go, oh, it doesn't matter. We love you anyway. And that. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't actually like that. No. You know what I mean? Why? Because you're just offering a defeatist attitude yeah. anyway if you do. You know, I know it's sort of t trying to take the pressure off you. And I suppose all your training sessions is just you of course. going through it yourself, isn't it's it? It's you. I'd been, I'd been to the stadium the day before that, mm. um, that game, done a normal routine. I'd kicked a couple of goals from there. Um, I'd got the one that I missed earlier out of the road because I'd nailed the oh. next one. Um, and, yeah, um, so I, I line it up, take a breath, and, and in we go. And... Oh no, it's starting to head a little bit left. You know what I, mean? I said, don't go left. You know, when you play golf and you have a bad yeah, yeah. shot, you should have used a six iron, but you got yeah. the seven iron, you got the lean. Oh! Yeah, I was. I was starting to get that sort of chest going that way. And then it just sort of found a little bit of work back towards the uh, black dot. Funnily enough, I do remember the day before the game, I'd kicked a couple similar. So it was a little bit of fate and a little bit of reward from sort of the work you put in. Um, but the, some of the funny things are, if, if you have a look, Gary Card and the trainer yeah. there. We, we, and I would have loved a post-kick uh, post celebration, <laughs> backflip or something, you know what I mean? And, and Gary Card and I can't even get the high five right. <laughs> we go to high five each other and it's oh. like, oh, and we slip and can't even get a cuddle, you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, yeah, so no, it was, um, yeah, it was a moment that I'd, uh, you know, I'd probably dreamt of it, to do be you, fair. Do you, know, do you know at that point you're going to win the match? There's yep. no golden point, by the way, you're going extra time. Yeah. You, you know that... We're just going to march on with this. Chances are we're, we're going to win it. We, yeah. you know, it, it, it's a tough speech for um, Brian Smith and his boys yes. in the huddle there to go yeah. into um, extra time. Peter Sharp and, and the Parramatta crew. Um, we are riding not only four wins on the trot, but in the semi-finals campaign, mm. you know what I mean? And then we've just come back from 16 points two weeks in a row. I mean, nothing much is going to stop us. We scored two tries in mm. extra time. And Polly kicks a field goal as well. So, um, yeah, it was... Um, in fact, we nearly won the game an extra time. Yeah. Um, 
Paul Carriage kicks the ball out of his in-goal area. Why? I don't know. I feel sorry. I feel and still then, to this day feel sorry for him. Yeah. At the time, are you aware of what he's maybe going through? Well, the funny thing, time, we had learned that time takes a long time in the last 10 minutes of a game. I mean, we scored three tries in, yeah. in, uh, in 11 minutes. We've got a minute to go, or from there, we can score another try. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, anyway, the ball ends up in the in-goal area, and, you know, it does funny things to your pressure. So Paul Carriage decides to kick the ball down downfield. Craig Paul amount of catches it on halfway. He says, I'll have a shot at the field goal. Yeah. <laughs> I'll win this game now. Did you think it was over? I did. Well, I was actually standing to the left of him yeah. here, and uh, right on halfway. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I haven't seen Polly kick the ball that far. I don't know how. But <laughs> <Adrenaline> <laughs> you know, before, thing, I've never it? seen it, yeah. yeah. And um, it does. It just, he had a blind, it, Lucky the cameraman could actually get the ball just in the black dot to see you could have the back of the yeah, black dot yeah. and see the white ball cut through it. So, yeah. But, um, in essence, it didn't really matter. We, we were chock-block full of confidence, and um, we roll on. I'd love uh, Billy Harrigan's thoughts on this, but uh, sliding doors, and this is what this program is mainly about, is the sliding doors of how we got to that moment. But I think he was a bit st stiff there, uh, Paul Carriage, because the first one he tries to put his foot dead, and Billy Harrigan deems that the ball was still. I, I don't necessarily believe it was, and, th and that dramatically changes the events. They go back to the 20 metre line, but anyway, it worked in your favour. Um, into extra time, you blow them away, 32 points to 20, yep. and you're on your way to a grand final, which ultimately you run into this team. Who, who were some of the names in the Broncos? Oh, the Broncos, red hot. They, um, you know, they, they had the Australian front row. You've got um, Andrew G, Shane Webke, you know, the halves were Langer and Walters, fullbacks Lockyer, Wendell Saylor, Darren Smith. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mick Hancock and um, Petro Sivanasiva on the bench, yep. I mean, shows you sort of what sort of team they are. Um, and, and they steamroll us in the final. We'd, we'd run out of puff. But um, yeah, uh, but it was a, it was probably the most fun. Even though we um, had a you know great group of guys through '94 and '95, win the comp in '95. Um, that final series was was young and fresh and alive. And you know, there's nothing better when you're part of a comeback. Yeah. There's nothing um, like it when you're on the receiving end of it too, because times just you're watching it come past you like Momentum. that. But when you're actually delivering the comeback, it's like, hey, this yeah, is yeah. easy. You know what I mean? And away you go. And sometimes you don't really know what you're doing. But um, yeah, so that was for me. I, I think it was the most you know fun I've ever had in a final series. So you've you've won the game. You've got a grand final in front of you. What does folks you say after this one? So after saying it was the greatest comeback <laughs> against Newcastle, you know, 16 points and that, he, he stands in the shed afterwards, and, and we actually all waited with sort of bated <laughs> breath and go, wonder what he's going to say this <laughs> time. You know what I mean? And he goes, guys, I can promise you through my eyes. He he said as a, in my Canterbury time, he he said that is the greatest comeback since last week. <laughs> <laughs> he's so true. Yeah, I know, and, and, and like folks, he had a, a dry sense of humour yeah. about him too, but he's actually pulled that rabbit really well, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, rest in peace, uh, Stephen, folks, too. What, what a great man he was. Oh, fantastic, yeah. He's the uh, heart and soul of, um, of that team after taking it over from uh, Chris Anderson as the trainer in 96. Uh, um, and then, well, sorry, in '98, and uh, and carried on to Premiership, obviously. But yeah, so no, he was he, he was a fun man, great man. What what was the? Um, you just hear it so often, I suppose. With these things, you need to live it to understand it. This family club around the Bulldogs. How, how would you describe that? Um, people like folks, see the Andersons, etc. Yeah, well, through that period, um, you know, Bullfrog. of the '90s, um, you know, Bullfrogs last years um, in the early '90s or, or mid '90s. Um, while he was still at the club, I mean. Um, and then, you know, Bob Hagen and the, the next crew of Canterbury people that came through and the Anderson um, history there as well with, with Chris getting his premiership there um, as a coach. Um, it was family, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, I toured on the Kiwi tour in 93 and I was away for a couple of months and uh, my wife's at home um, over on the, in Belrose, North Sydney and um, she gets a Christmas present for our eldest, Devon, sent well, to her from um, Alan Nelson, our, our football manager, you know what I mean? And, and you're not she, you're I'm not, not there, I'm, there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. No, I'm only, I, I arrive in January when yeah. I get back from the tour, you know what I mean? And so my wife rings up and sort of, um, she, she's chock-a-block stoked though. She's yeah. just going, God, how good's this? Yeah. So Devon's got a little present from the from footy club and what have you. And I sort of, oh wow, I mean, I didn't even know, so you know what I mean? I'll make a couple other phone calls and the boys are on tour. Um, Britty and Jason Hetherington were on tour, the um, Australian team at the same time. So I said, is that normal? I said, yeah, that always happens, you know what I mean? Yeah, the one percent. And so, and I also remember some, some times when, um, you know, Linda wasn't doing so well with um, carrying a couple of the, our children and Bullfrog would pick up the phone and ring her and that. And, you know, I know, I know the, end, the clubs are bigger entities now mm. um, than, than some of that detail, but that, that detail holds you to a place. So For 20 years, for 20 years, the Bulldogs had the 
the keys to the to the castle basically when it came to goal kicking. Like it was mm. your great self, and then it was Hazem El Masri. Yep. So you retired as the. How good was he? Hazem was oh, fantastic. Well, well um, you retired as the all-time leading point scorer, which he ultimately goes past. But when I'm going through the numbers, your last three seasons playing where Hazem is there. So you've cost him hundreds of points, no doubt. <laughs> he probably catches 3,000 without you. <laughs> he does. But, but I want to ask you this, right? And but this way, if he plays, I don't. Well, well I, I remember being uh, at the Tigers in 2005, and I played no part in that. But if I played one little part was maybe I kept Brett Hodgson honest in the goal kick, and he had a great year that year, and I yeah. was sort of sniffing around. And the reason I say that is that your last three years with the boot, uh, you kicked basically nearly 90% for those three years. That was your yep. best season, 98, 99, 2000. Hazem was there. Do you think his presence there played a part in you achieving such big numbers? I'm uh, 31, going to 34 in those last three years, and I've got the, the next best thing in goal kicking coming right behind me. I, I remember playing a couple of games injured, so Hazem wouldn't get a kick at goal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and folks, you know, called time on me at the right time too. You know what I mean? I probably wanted to go round again, but um, it was fair. They had, had a more than capable replacement, um, and he was playing better football as well, Hazem. But yeah, I probably cost him um, a, a fair few points, but it, it was good. Um, we kicked a lot together. Um, but we'd also go and kick on our own as well. It wasn't that, okay, I'm having a kick, so Hazem would come and have a kick, because I'd kick anyway, and, and so would he. I mean, he was real professional about what he did. Um, you know, I can remember a New Zealand goal kicker called Grant Fox, and I watched what he did and trained, mm. and I sort of tried to sort of um, go down those lines as well with his sort of discipline. Um, and Hazem picked up some disciplines, I would imagine, from you know what, how I went about it, but he basically introduced his own too, you know what I mean? Kick with a little bit more shape than, than I do um, Hazem. But yeah, so no, he was he was really you know good for, for Daryl Halligan the last Ooh. couple of years. He kept me more than honest. So if he's not there, do you reckon you would have got the same percentages? Do you think it's that he fine-tuned you, kept yeah. you honest? Percentages are something that you can easily refer to. Yeah. You know, a good goal kicker in the NRL should get 100 shots at goal a year. Yes. You know what I mean? So basically every shot at goal is 1%. You know what I mean? And if you can get close to 90% over 100 goals, um, then you're on song. And that might take you more than one year to do. That'll take you four or five years to actually put yourself in the frame to do that. Mm. So, um, you know, I think 89, 87, 89 were my last three years in terms of percentages. Yes. And we, but we're kicking well over 100 goals a year. So, yeah, so part of um, having Hazem chip away at me there in the last little while was, was sure, you know, just reward there. Everything you sort of touched, well, Hazem became the all-time leading point scorer. You might have something to do with a bloke who could challenge him. He's basically the only bloke who could. Can you see Jared Croker going past Hazem? Yeah, Jared, um, he certainly can if he uh, keeps himself fit and mm. injury-free. You know, you never know what's around the corner. He's had a, had a great career to date. Um, he's got the work ethic to, to boot along with it. There's some other kickers coming up through the comp, you know, um, Nathan Cleary as well. Um, looks like he, you know, if you get longevity in the game, um, you know, and, and that's a key. Mm. But uh, I will stress the importance that goal kicking is not a collective. Goal kicking is something that an individual delivers back to the team. Mm. And, and, and I still fundamentally think that that's how it should be trained. Yeah. One final thing. Um you know the Hazamel Masri feeling about being that second fiddle because... He's not second fiddle. Well, no, but when he was coming through, as far oh. as not being able to get a kick, because that's how your career started. Oh, yeah. Um, I know that feeling has. I probably haven't explained it to him, but I could never get a kick at goal because my older brother kicked all the goals <laughs> at school. And he's two years older than me. Yeah. Um, I make up the numbers and play on most of his teams, but I'm normally the one getting the ball because we only have one ball between us, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And by the time I've got back to have a kick, he's wrestled it off me and he's kicking the second one, you <laughs> yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and then the third and then I'll go home and I don't get a kick. Yeah. But yeah, so my older brother was a pretty accomplished goal kicker and it wasn't until he actually um, left school that I had two years of kicking at school to, um, mind you, I'd watched a lot of it and managed yeah, yeah. to kick a couple before him. But yeah, so no, I know, I know that uh, younger brother feeling. Don't worry about that. Daryl Halligan, thank cool. you for taking all of us back yeah. to that moment. What a moment, what a moment in time and uh, well done. It's been fun, one I won't uh, forget. No, we'll be seeing plenty of times this week, don't worry about that. Thanks very much, mate, appreciate it. Good night, Crystal.